from Michigan. He's a environmental chemist at the School of Public Health. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree from the Cairo University in chemistry and geology. He's got his diploma of public health and water resources at Cairo. Uh, he earned his master's and his PhD in environmental health sciences at Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and did postdoctoral work at Harvard University. And he's currently a consultant on uh, environmental impact study on the Nile River. And he's going to speak on global world resources. Uh, please welcome Khalil Mansi. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm indeed honored to be here, and uh, I was uh, yesterday a guest at uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Ro Robert Bauman, and I told him that uh, one of the first universities that I tried to get to enroll in was Ames, Iowa, here, in the Iowa State University. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, they didn't respond fast enough, or uh, destiny took me to North Carolina. But uh, it's a great honor and privilege to have this opportunity to talk to you today. In my presentation, I shall try to give you an overview of uh, the problem of water resources in a world with increasing population. But I'm not the type that I can speak about uh, things uh, uh, without a little bit of uh, specificity in them. Uh, so I'm going to give you a very specific points. I'll start my presentation by giving an indication of how much the population of the world is increasing. Then what's, what are the problems with resources? Can you hear me? And what are the problems with uh, resources in, on Earth? And uh, uh, what's available in terms of water? And what's the problem of water quality and how different nations are approaching that? Then I'm going to give you a very specific example about the River Nile in Egypt. And I have been fortunate enough to conduct a uh, seven-year study sponsored by the Ford Foundation and some other agencies to study the, manag the management and the impact of hydraulic controls of the River Nile. And uh, then uh, I'll conclude it with some uh, views, my personal views about the whole thing in context of north-south confrontation, meaningly, I guess, developed vis-a-vis -vis less developed countries. There's no doubt that the world's population is increasing at a very fast rate, exponential rate, as a matter of fact. And I'll show you a curve that, if you notice that, that uh, I just don't want to turn the projector on and off, you know, so, uh, the curve shows that the world population is an exponential thing. We are uh, uh, increasing at a large, at a large rate. Now, Anybody who has some biological background and count bacteria find that this, after a while, this will tapers off and then something will happen that the whole population will start decreasing. We haven't reached that. There's no doubt that this is causing strain, a strain on resources. What are these resources? The water resources in terms of availability and quality atmospheric resources in terms of the quality of the air, hydrometeorology, hydrometeorology air quality, etc., etc., and uh, forestry, uh, energy resources. Today, I'm going only talk about water resources per se. And if we consider water, we find that water is probably the most abundant uh, species of any chemical in the biosphere. The biosphere is the 
is that portion of the Earth that is uh, inhabited by bi biological species where life exists. It's uh, water exists in the form of uh, solid ice, liquid, liquid water, or gas like vapor, and it circulates around. Leonardo da Vinci said that water is the, the machine of nature. It's the driving force of nature. Water evaporates, goes up in the air, precipitates, dissolves minerals, goes back to the ocean, and so on. This very hi efficient hydraulic machine propels life on Earth. The problem comes with the distribution of water as a function of population density. There are certain areas of the Earth that have populations with very little water and certain areas have populations with large water. I'd like to start with the slide projection, please. Can everybody see that? Uh, or you want it up a little bit, maybe? <coughs> Can you raise it up a little bit? OK. On the abscissa, I have the years. And on the ordinate, the population in uh, millions. And you see uh, about nine. Actually, 1975, the world population was about 4 billion, and by 2000, we will be about 6 billion. So this is what I meant by the exponential growth. Next slide, please. continue a while because it seems like it's been so long. As you see here, oh, I'm shaking. I better talk to that thing. Um, the uh, <coughs> water evaporates from the surface of the ocean, which is about 75% of 97% uh, of the total uh, water evaporation comes from the ocean. And uh, then the evaporation, uh, some of it precipitated back on the ocean, some of it it's transported to Earth where it forms rain, and the rain falls on Earth and goes back to the ocean. And these numbers are the amounts in, in terms of 1,000 kilometers per year. That means 412,000 kilometers, cubic kilometers of water per year on a global scale. <coughs> That's what I meant by this machine, this evaporation, condensation, and so on. Next slide, please. Now, this is a map of the world. And uh, those, uh, if you look at the index at the lower left-hand side, you find that the the areas with the minimum precipitation, those indicated by dashes, are the desert, the Sahara Desert, the Kalahari Desert in southern uh, Africa, a major portion of Australia, and central parts of the United States and some parts of South Southern America. And uh, so there's a distribution of rainfall anyway. And the message that I'd like to give that the distribution of water, fresh water, is very, uh, uh, varies all over the place. How much fresh water we have? We have about four multiplied by 10 to the 15 cubic meter of fresh water all over the globe. 75% of that is found in the polar ice cap and glaciers. 75% of the fresh water available on Earth is found in the ice caps and glaciers. About 25% of fresh water is in the ground. We call it groundwater. 
Some of it is closer by, nearby, some of it way deep. Lakes, freshwater lakes, form 0.3% of the total, and the moisture in soil is about 0.06%, and the atmosphere is about 0.03%, and the major rivers and streams on the earth constitute a meager portion of about 0.03%. That gives you an idea of the distribution of fresh water we have on Earth. Fresh water is, a, is an essential ingredient of life. And you'll find, just by looking at the map, where there is a lot of rain and adequate temperature for biological production, we have massive forestry and massive biological production. And this is uh, indicated in the next slide, please. Oh, in this slide, I have a distribution of some of the countries that utilize different portions of their water resources. Countries using less than 5% of the total quantity of water available for particular countries include Albania, Aus Austria, Finland, and so on. Countries using between 5 to 10% are some European countries, including UK and USSR, country u countries using between 10 to 20, Czechoslovakia, Fra France, Greece, and so on, countries using over 20%, and that's very strenuous level, Bulgaria, Cyprus, East Germany, Hungary, and Malta. N next slide, please. Now, <coughs> the larger the amount of precipitation at temperatures where there is possibility of biological life, the larger the intensity and the magnitude of that biological life. In this table, I'm just showing an illus illustration of the distribution of productivity. Primary productivity <coughs> is the formation of of plant uh, the fixation of carbon dioxide and formation of plant plant production to a large extent and uh, the zones indicated are the desert side of the Sahel zone the Sahel zone is a band in the in the uh, just north of equatorial Africa very arid part of the world And uh, this has been studied, and you find that where the annual rate of precipitation, if it increases, the primary productivity or plant production also increases. Not only that, the number of cattle per unit area also increases. Very elementary, I agree. Everybody knows it, but at least there is a direct <coughs> proportionality between availability of fresh water and life or intensity and quantity of biological life. Next slide, please. Now, <coughs> water, fresh water is used for different purposes, from domestic water supply for household as well as municipal use, to irrigation, hydropower generation, navigation, recreation, etc., etc., and uh, a, a distribution of the kind of different uses categorized in municipal rural water supply, agriculture water use, and industrial water use for different countries is indicated in this table. Now, for The table indicates the total use in cubic meter per capita. A country like India, for example, used 600 cubic meter per capita. United States used 2,300 cubic meter of fresh water per capita. Remember, that's for all uses. Distrib the distribution is also interesting. Look at the column that indicates 
municipal, municipal domestic use versus agriculture and industry. In India, for example, for municipal and rural use, it's 3% of that water is used for municipal industrial use. 96% for agriculture and 1% for industry. Contrast this with the United States, 10% for municipal use, 42% for agriculture, and 48 for industry. This in give us a contrast between a developing country like India and the pattern of water use vis-a-vis -vis water use in a more developed country like the United States. In between poles, uh, different countries as indicated in this diagram, in this table. Next slide, please. Now this slide is a little bit uh, uh, too much information, but if you look at the lower part of the slide, you'll find that the estimated service coverage for sanitation in developing countries between 1970 and 1980, look at the percentage of total population served. And this is distributed urban, rural, and total. Let's take the total figure in the lower part of the lower table. We find that in 1970, it was 27. In 1975, <coughs> it was 33. And in 1980, it went back to 25. And the message I want to give in that, that as we go along, we find that in developing countries, things are not really improving. As a matter of fact, with population increase, the availability of water for sanitation is getting less. And that table shows that. The population pressure in, in developing countries is making it less, making water for sanitation purposes uh, less available. Next slide, please. On a global scale, the water available or in use actually for agriculture, domestic and industrial purposes and mining, etc., estimated in 1967 and projected for 2000 is shown in this figure. And I would like to go to the right-hand column and look at percent only. This probably would be much easier. In 1967, 70% of water for agriculture 70% of total water available was used for <coughs> irrigation purpose. 3% for light livestock, 1% for rural domestic purposes, and 4 for the urban domestic purposes, 22 for industry and mining. In the year 2000, the estimates are uh, different for irrigation purposes, it went from 70 to 51, livestock from 3 to 2, and uh, the other variation, industry and mining went from 22 to 41. We have to realize that the main water, fresh water use nowadays is for irrigation purposes on a global scale. And if we would like to think that based on current practices, we're going to be able to provide more agriculture expansion, more food for increasing population, then water availability of fresh water will be limited. There is no doubt about it. On the other hand, the only salvation is that we have more efficient technology of agricultural production that utilizes less water than existing technology which requires that huge amount of fresh water. Next slide, please. Now, this is my message about the quantity of fresh water available. We have seen where it's distributed on Earth, 
some of the typical uses contrasted between developed countries and less developed countries. Now we are facing another question about water quality. And this is more intense of a problem in more industrialized nations of the world. And this diagram here shows the cycle of matter and energy in an aquatic system. Agricultural pro effluents or effluents from sewage and domestic uh, water use or effluent from industry as well as erosion goes into the aquatic system as inputs on the left side of the screen. This input mass of runoff, whatever, will go into solution. Some of it will settle at the bottom of that water body, call it a lake or a reservoir. And then it will be consumed in part by plants and fishes, and some of the birds will feed in it. Now, this, this input will change the quality of the water. And we may find that the water quality, we have fresh water, but in of a quality that's not suitable for a specific use. Accordingly, the question of water quality has become very important in the last four or five decades, and it, it became limiting in certain situations in the globe. Next slide, please. What are some of the typical substances associated with uh, contaminant in water? Uh, <coughs> if you look at this table, we find they can be classified as dissolved or suspended. For from domestic origin, can be organic waste, detergent, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, pesticides, metals. They can form such chemicals like nitrates, phosphates, phosphates etc. From industrial uh, origin, can you focus that please a little bit, or I'm not seeing it well. Uh, there's a very wide range of, of organic substances that gets into the aquatic system. And uh, certainly from agricultural product, products. Now, I would like you to know that the water available on Earth is being reused const constantly. And we are reusing our water even not on a global scale, on a national scale. If you look at any river, like the Ohio River, by the time the Ohio River reaches Cincinnati, one glass of water in four would be used at least. And uh, so water use is essentially going on. That means the water is used and goes back to the river. And certainly all the water that we are using now is the same kind of water that during the, during Cleopatra or whatever has been going around. It's, it's just evaporates, goes up the back to the sea and evaporates, go up some of it in the river that we use, you know. So the concept of water use and the quality, the material in it is, is uh, the, the point that I would like to make now that water use is a common practice. Next slide, please. Some of these chemicals that we introduce in the aquatic environment tend to accumulate in, uh, in a manner that we call it bioaccumulation. One of these chemicals that has become very famous is called PCB. And uh, this shows the level in seawater less than 0.01 microgram per kilogram. And this level increases as, as you go up in the biological scale. So we find that more level, more chemicals are found in uh, the plankton, more chemicals are found in fishes, and more chemicals are found in birds, and ultimately the birds will die. And that's the demise of the bald eagle 
or some of the bird population in some parts of the world. Next slide, please. Uh, the other main source of water available to us is groundwater. We don't get all our water from surface origin like lakes or reservoir. And uh, areas of heavy precipitation allows water to go into aquifers. Aquifers are more permeable stra stra strata surrounded by less permeable regions. And then you can get these wells, they come under pressure, they are called artesian wells. A lot of irrigation is done from underground sources and so on. Under the Sahara Desert of Egypt is one of the oldest aquifers uh, in the world. And uh, they say that the water there is about uh, 5,000, 10,000 years old, you know. So it's fossil water, if I may say. Now even that so resource, underground water, that you may think it's uh, safe from pollution has become a source of concern recently. And nowadays we have a very in e intensive <coughs> program to look into pollution of groundwater. Next slide, please. So in this slide, I'm illustrating the sources of contamination in underground water. And uh, the source of contamination can be uh, when you spread on the land fertilizers or pesticides, they can percolate and either in seepage or cracks or can seep through and ultimately find their way into the artesian aquifer. This is not only land uh, surface irrig irrigation or agriculture, uh, uh, agricultural practices, but also landfill, sanitary landfills, and hazardous waste that has become a nightmare in the United States. Where we put these chemicals? We dump them in the ground, <coughs> right? We, I mean, uh, there are certain places in uh, some parts of United States where drums of chemicals have been buried and they corrode and the chemical leaches out and seeps and then gets in the groundwater and people downstream in this aquifer get their water and they get sick, right? And uh, these, this, this is the problem of some of the hazardous waste which is a waste product from chemical industry primarily. Next slide. Oh, this is just a list of some of these chemicals. Next slide, please. Now, the uh, <coughs> for this reason, there has been a major program in the United States for control of hazardous waste and the uh, management of groundwater resources. The fresh groundwater use in the United States is illustrated in this table and we see that we really depend a great deal on groundwater for use either public supplies, rural supplies, irrigation or industry. And this table shows from 1950 to 1970 cost. And of course as you increase these pollution abate abatement percent, the cost will be very expensive, the control cost. At 100%, the control cost is very high, 100% pollution abatement. At 0% pollution abatement, the control cost is very low, nothing. And uh, the idea here is try to balance the damage cost versus the control cost and find a point in the middle indicated by X where you can have a trade-off between damage cost and control cost. Next slide, please. Water sources management programs <coughs> is a very extensive type of an operation that requires people of different kinds. 
It requires the water resource engineer who plans utiliza the utilization and who takes charge of the construction and manage the works. Requires the hydrologist who supplies data concerning resources, forecasts the effects of planned intervention. A planned intervention is like constructing a dam on a river. Draws up an operational forecast. It requires the environmentalist who is concerned and checks to see that no undesirable change will be made to the environment. And that's probably the most difficult and unquantitative task, uh, relatively speaking, these days. Next slide, please. I just wanted to illustrate here that our controls nowadays are based on controlling the source, which would be on the left-hand side of this slide, controlling the environment in the middle, that's the middle compartment, or controlling the target. And the target can be a human being, a forest, a lake, or whatever. How we control the source. In, com in pollution abatement uh, technology, you control the emission of contaminants from the source. That's how we have emission controls on automobiles or from stacks from industry and so on. Controlling the environment, we say that the ambient, concent the concentration of, of air quality should not be, uh, of a given contaminant in air should not be higher than a certain level. Or the concentration of a contaminant in the water we drink should not be higher at a given level. And that's the control of the environment. The control of the target is how much lead you, you consume by breathing air. There's a lot of lead in air. You know that in each gallon of gasoline, we have about two grams of lead. And that lead is emitted in the atmosphere. EPA now is trying to decrease it from two grams per gallon to about 0.3. That's uh, the uh, leaded gas there. And uh, the unleaded gas is only a phenomenon in the United States. The rest of the world uses leaded gasoline. Next slide, please. In international concept, we find that the environment is certainly one environment as far as Earth is concerned. And national pollution strategies, pollution control strategies, should be coordinated with the neighboring country should be either regional or global in a sense, which is very difficult and more uh, idealistic in most cases. And this frame here is something about the national pollution cycle in terms that, let's say we have uh, air pollution, water pollution, and some of these pollutants go into a sink. A sink is, can be the bottom of the lake or soil. So there is emission and goes into the air and the water and back to the sink. But there's something coming from outside the country. Air masses moving from outside the country are bringing contaminants. Rivers originating from outside the country are bringing contaminants and so on. And this country, this frame here, is also exporting contaminants to a downstream country, downstream in terms of air mass movement or river movement. Very few countries in the world have been able to collaborate in uh, environmental quality control programs. However, a uh, number of countries have coordinated their efforts for river management and schemes <coughs> like uh, the uh, uh, Danube, in spite that the Danube cuts between East and West Europe, you know, uh, like uh, the uh, Rhine River. These are two examples of riparian countries that develop joint commissions to control and manage the river resources, the Danube and the Rhine in Europe. 
Next slide, please. Uh, some of the major water resources management schemes of the world is, this, for example, what's happening in uh, the West here. The uh, solid lines reflect uh, canals that have been dug to bring water from the And this brings a lot of masses of water from the Colorado River and from the San Joaquin River and from a region in the, uh, the third aqueduct here in the middle. Next slide, please. In India, there are huge water management schemes. Uh, and India has a very strange situation because wa availability of water is dependent on the monsoon and the monsoon rain uh, situation varies dramatically uh, from one year to another. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, this is South America and uh, South America is a continent endowed with huge amount of water. Uh, there are two main river basin, the Amazon River and the Parana River Basin. And the Parana that, that river that starts in southern Brazil, goes into Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina has been subject to major man-made interventions recently for the purpose of no more than hydropower generation. A country like Brazil doesn't have oil. So where are they gonna get their energy from? Uh, they uh, they uh, d develop procedures to uh, get gasohol, you know? Gasohol is a procedure of fermenting plants and get sort of alcohol. We have it here in this country. Uh, they have done that. But one clean source is to generate hydropower by erecting dams. And one of the largest dams in the world have just been erected and fill is filling up. It's called Itaipu. And it's between Brazil and Paraguay. Right, right here. And... Uh, <coughs> Next slide, please. I was just there about six weeks ago, and that is the, the Parana River at the Tres Frontier, which is the frontier between Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. Next slide. It's a magnificent river. This is uh, the, the, the bridge between Paraguay and Brazil, called the Frenchville, the Friendship bridge north of Iguazu Falls. Next slide. And that's the diversion of the river. This dike is man-made dike. Next slide. And that is a mountain of, of concrete. Literally a mountain of concrete. They are blocking the river. And uh, it's the, I've never seen anything like that. It's about 100 million kilowatt hour per year. It's like what the whole state of Michigan utilizes annually for power. That's after it, after it uh, develops. Next slide, please. <coughs> this is a picture of the reservoir just before filling. Next slide. Next slide. This shows you the size of the tunnels that bring water to the power station. And. Uh, People there look like small insects, <laughs> things like that. So uh, there are huge uh, man-made <coughs> interventions for hydropower generation, Itaipu, and the Time Magazine came with an article last week, I think, showing that Itaipu start filling. And what happened exactly is that the Brazilian just blocked the river. And uh, uh, for 12 days to fill the reservoir. Now, there are tremendous ecological uh, uh, ramifications for that. 
Next slide, please. My example that I'd like to spe be more specific about is the River Nile, which is backward. <laughs> um, can you rotate the slide? Don't turn upside down, just rotate it, please. Now, the Nile is the longest river in the world. It's about 6,800 kilometers. It originates from, the ancient Egyptians thought it, ori it originates from heaven, you know. For an Egyptian, that is a very logic origin of the Nile because it is the life of Egypt, the jugular vein of the country. No, uh, just rotate it. Okay, now the, the Nile originates here. <coughs> That's the source of the Nile, and the Burundi and Rwanda, these two little small countries. Uh, this is Lake Victoria. Actually, the origin of the Nile has been identified as the Kagera River in East Tanzania and West Tanzania. The Nile goes into a very long tip. By the time it goes into this area, it cuts through a swamp called the Chad Swamp. It loses about half of its depth by evaporation. Then it goes north into the White Nile. It joins the Blue Nile, which originates in the eastern East Ethiopia plateau. Very heavy water for the area. And together they form the main <coughs> Nile. And the main Nile travels north into the desert, the Sahara Desert. It's the only river that <coughs> goes through three climatic regions, the uh, tropical, subtropical, and desert environment. There are 10 riparian countries that share the Nile. Uh, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, Central African Republic, Ethiopia, and it's only Sudan and Egypt that, that are the net users of water. The rest of these countries that I've mentioned have a lot of rainfall. These are water poor areas. Now, <coughs> In context of, uh, there are several projects here that have been conducted on the Nile. The most, <coughs> do I have the, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, I beg your pardon? Okay, fine. Now, the, uh, <coughs> the British in the 1800s, uh, when they were in charge of Egypt, or uh, they occupied Egypt, they were very much concerned about the safety of Egypt as the main route to India. Accordingly, they were very much concerned about the Nile. So they start moving from Egypt south, they occupied Sudan, and from Sudan south, they occupied uh, Uganda and so on. And uh, they used uh, very good they conducted very good studies about the hydrology of the Nile, and that's our main source of information about the hydrology of the Nile. Before that, history tells us that some pharaohs or some uh, ancient Egyptians constructed dams, but the record is not very clear. The most continuous record is about maybe uh, from the early 1800s or from Napoleon's uh, uh, trip to Egypt and the description to Egypt where he accumulated this information. So the, the British did construct a lot of dams on the Nile to regulate the river flow. 
Next slide, please. And uh, in this, we can see the two branches of the Nile, uh, sources of the Nile, the White Nile and the Blue Nile. And uh, <coughs> the White Nile, if you look from the beginning, you see the Kagera River, Lake Victoria, Lake Albert, then the White Nile. And then you can see the elevation of Lake Tana in Ethiopia, and then the Blue Nile, and they join into Khartoum. So these are ele elevations, and these are distances. And the Nile goes downhill by gravity all the way to the Mediterranean. And that is the Mediterranean. This part here is Egypt. That part <coughs> here is Sudan. Next slide, please. 